Come on, let I'd especially like to thank the Peaceful Warriors Project for celebrating the stories, the important stories, and creative power of our veterans. Tonight we're remembering a legend, Alan Barnes. He served in Vietnam, came home to Detroit, and became an American jazz legend. I wouldn't trade growing up in Detroit and in Michigan for anything in the world because I had a chance to be around great music, always surrounded by music. And when I was in high school, I could go within, you know, two mile radius and see three great jazz bands just in my neighborhood. Now being a musician, I think that just gives me an edge anywhere I go. I appreciate it. It's a, it's a unique experience. As you may know, in 1987, House Resolution 57 declared jazz a rare and valuable National American treasure. The resolution was introduced by Detroit's own representative, John Conyers, a champion of Detroit and jazz for many decades. Now, I've always been of the mind that if jazz is a rare and valuable National American treasure, surely the musicians that make the music we call jazz are national treasures as well. Many of those musicians hail from Detroit, and we salute one of our rare and valuable local treasures, Alan Barnes. Whether it was the big sounds of his tenor sax, the sweet melodies of his soprano sax, the soulful sounds of his flute, and every now and then he'd even give you some clarinet, Allen will forever be connected to Detroit and the great music of this city, forming the soundtrack of an era that lives fondly in the hearts and minds of people around the world. In addition to being a gifted musician, Allen Barnes was a veteran of the Vietnam conflict. Throughout his life, Alan recognized the healing power of music, music's ability to bridge gaps. One of the projects Alan was working on was something dear to his heart, the Peaceful Warriors Project, which he co-founded.
It is such a treat playing with Alan Barnes. He is, uh, he is a sublime musician and player. He is a lovely human being. And at the same time, he's very demanding. He's demanding on stage. You know, he wants everybody to bring out their best. So you're always kind of there to, to bring your best to the music. Uh, I love playing with him. It's a, a joy. Touches my foolish heart Say your love Never, never change Keep that breathless charm Won't you please imagine Cause I love you And the way you look tonight Is, is is full of fire and I'm and I'm a I consider myself a, a fiery drummer too. Well actually I'm gonna tell you if you if you live in Detroit <laughs> all the musicians I've noticed in this uh, great city has this fire this this energy that I have not seen anywhere else and Alan exhibits that that passion and it comes out through the music. We also have a nice nice conversations together within the music so it's just it's just a lot of fun um, playing with him to see Alan all the time and we used to see each other in passing and until recently we, we started playing together and it's been really, really a good thing because he has that big tenor sound and he, we play in tune together, we play like one, we play in the melodies and we just, just all the energy, you know, the energy that he has on the stage. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Playing with Alan is a lot of fun. It really brings me back to the 1960s foundation jazz playing that, uh, that I really grew up listening to. And so it takes me back to a time where uh, it makes me smile just to think about it. Playing with Alan Barnes is, uh, is a great experience. We've, we've done this a few times before, and uh, the thing I like about it, Alan is he's uh, got a great sound. Uh, he's accessible as a person, meaning that it's, he's easy to play with, and you know it's always gonna be a great time. Uh, he plays 
jazz standards that everyone will recognize and that everyone will enjoy, and including the band. Uh, if we're not having fun, then uh, something's wrong. And I know when Alan's, when Alan's here, we're always going to have some fun. Just the way, just the way. Trumpeter and band leader Racy Biggs is an original member of the Peaceful Warriors Project and is here tonight playing the music of U.S. veterans Irving Berlin, Dave Brubeck, Clark Terry, Wayne Shorter, Donald Byrd, and John Coltrane. Meeting Allen was like actually meeting a star because he had a reputation in the city as well. And he was a few years older than me, so we always looked up to him. If I tell another saxophone player in the group, in my group, hey, I'm going to see Allen, and it was like, wow, wow, you got a chance to, to talk to Allen. Allen was a wonderful, beautiful person. And I think him being a veteran kind of gave him a different perspective on life, period. He was always a giving person already, but I think it, it kind of focused him in on helping the generations that are behind him and making sure they had the tools to go forward and to encourage them because he was always encouraging people, as I say, and especially the youth. And in the midst of it, I'm gonna make people aware of what my connection with the service as well, and how it can shape you to be a better person. So I, Alan played a very, I think he played a very good part in identifying, tying all of the service and the musicians and bringing them up into a, a one ball here. And that ball is the Peaceful Warriors Project. He was a very important person. And I think keeping his legacy alive as to all the things, all the mentorship he had, all of the energy that he put into the Peaceful Warriors and, and, and all the different schools that he touched, he really touched a lot of people. You know, he left his impact here. It's very important to keep his legacy alive, keep talking about the things that he's done. He was a great teacher. He was a great innovator. He was good at getting people together and bring, drawing out good things out of them that they didn't know they had in it. But he could see it, and he knew how to do it. He was one of those kind of gifted guys. <laughs>
Balboa. You too. Everybody got jokes, huh? <laughs> I know they've been messing with my horn. I turn my head to do things to my horn, make me think I'm crazy. That's all right. One of these days. I'm Ken Burns, and I invite you to watch Jazzland on this PBS station. Alan produced and hosted Jazzland, a program on PBS. You see, Alan was more than a musician. He was a broadcaster and educator as well. We searched through our archives and found this clip of Alan and Dr. Billy Taylor. Sitting in has a deep history in jazz. Improvisation is the cornerstone of the music. Recently, when Dr. Billy Taylor was on tour in Michigan, I got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to jam with a legendary jazz icon. <laughs> I've lived through uh, much of the history of jazz, and what I try to do is to give them uh, personal references. I mean, when I talk about uh, Sidney Bechet, I heard Sidney Bechet, and I uh, had the honor of, of sitting into his group uh, many years ago. Uh, uh, and many musicians that, uh, uh, Louis Armstrong, people that I looked up to, uh, and who were the, the fountainheads from which uh, all the music we play came. I, uh, I can talk about them in the first person. And so that's what I try to share with young people, the fact that it is a continuum. I mean, the things that Bechet did, the things that, that Louis Armstrong did, the things that King Oliver and many of the early pioneers of, of the music did uh, have paved the way for what I do at the piano, what you do on the saxophone, and what other people uh, are doing today. Do 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 do
just had to mark your calendar for the first Saturday of the month when Alan was a featured artist at Baker's Keyboard Lounge. Every first Saturday, Alan was there with his band Primetime, who, by the way, are preserving his legacy and continue to perform first Saturdays at Baker's. I think Alan had fundamental basics and standards. He wasn't going to do anything for free unless it was for a really good cause. He did several gigs that he basically told me this is for um, a school or this is for an after school program or children or something and we're, we're just going to do it. But if it was something organized that had a, a dollar value attached, he, he made sure that he was fairly compensated. But if he wanted to do it, he wouldn't hit you over the head, you know? But if he didn't want to do something, he would hit you over the head. <laughs> and he said, you gotta value your time, you gotta value your gift, and you gotta value all the years you put in to hone your craft. He would take opportunities to practice in various places and if that happened to be on a park bench or in front of a ball game or wherever, you know, he would just, he, he would find his way to get what he needed out of his system and to practice and respect his craft wherever. And he wasn't limited by where he would do that. Alan was a collection of his entire life and his entire understanding of humanity. And he was a very humane individual who believed in, you don't get to hold on to everything and just keep it to yourself. He believed that you could best serve humanity by passing on what you've learned and passing on what's been passed to you. And that's what I got most out of my friendship with him for almost a decade. 
I miss them terribly. It's a time of the year that kind of strikes a chord with me most, most times, but I'm glad to be talking about it because it's important for me to keep his memory alive. I was with the uh, uh, 4th Infantry Division and I was in the headquarters company band. But inside of that headquarters company band, we had a group called Hard Times that was actually formed by um, the guy that I replaced in Vietnam. His name was Henry Threadgill. He's a very same, famous alto saxophone player who lives in France right now. But anyway, Henry Threadgill started this group called Hard Times and um, it was another saxophone player named Willie Driffin playing tenor, uh, Mike Campbell playing bass, and uh, a guy named Ken Paselli playing drums. So there was just four pieces, nothing that you had to plug in or anything like that. So we got a chance to go and play for GIs way out in the field where you, you never would see Bob Hope or anything like that. So anytime that um, you know they would ask us if we wanted to go play, we would always accept because they would be so grateful that anybody would just come out there to play for them, you know, at a base camp. So we, uh, we enjoyed what we did, you know. So I'm saying that was one of the good parts about being in Vietnam, that the soldiers really appreciated the music. Sharing their stories is one of the best ways we can honor our veterans, including the Peaceful Warriors Project Award winner, Bobby Barnes. Bobby was part of the 298th Army Band and had his own impressive jazz career. Perhaps most importantly, Bobby introduced his nephew, Alan Barnes, to the saxophone. And from one legend, another legend was born. Alan, uh, my nephew, we could go back to a little bit of uh, the earlier days <laughs> before he became a musician. <laughs> I, the reason why I'm laughing is because <laughs> when he started out, the reason I put the instrument in his hand, because he, he was quite a guy when he was about 16 or 17 and in high school. <laughs> and so that's why I told his mother, I say, we got to do something for Alan because he's, he seemed to be <laughs> a pretty rough character. And I say, let me see if I can get an instrument for him, and maybe he might be interested in that. And sure enough, we, she, they were very happy to do that, you know, so they purchased a horn for him. And I started giving him music lessons. And lo and behold, that was exactly what he needed. That brought out the Allen that we know today. Yeah, because of being exposed to the music. Alan signed up to go to Howard University. He was a little late in, in signing up. And so uh, they told him that he wouldn't be able to, to uh, enroll at that time. But Donald found out that he was my nephew because he was a professor at, at Howard University. And so he <clears throat> bypassed all that and had Alan be able to come on in. He was able to get in because of Donald Byrd. And so <clears throat> evidently he was doing quite well because Donald uh, introduced him to become one of the Blackbirds because of Donald and our relationship. And then he had the ability too. See now, it wasn't just, just because of being, being my nephew, he could play. Was Alan pretty? Oh, Bird thought he was good. <laughs> that's that's a, that's opinion right there. Yeah, Bird thought he was good, and he was good. That was one of the highlights of his life because uh, Donald decided that since he was my nephew, we'll, we'll let him 
you promote him into his, the blackbirds. <laughs> It all started with native Detroiter Donaldson Toussaint Le Overture Bird II, better known as Donald Bird. Touring the world while continuing his commitment to the world of education, as a professor at Howard University, Donald Bird changed the world of jazz with his crossover album, Blackbird. From playing sold out clubs to playing sold out stadiums, this new form of music soared, especially when five students in his band spread their musical wings and became the Blackbirds. And the rest, as they say, is history. Here tonight at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History is a piece of history. Ladies and gentlemen, the Blackbirds have come to town to honor an original member of the Blackbirds, Alan C. Barnes. Are you ready? Because here they are, the world famous Blackbirds. <laughs> I never really met Donald until I got to Howard University. Uh, Donald was uh, told by one of my uncles that, you know, that I played the saxophone. My uncle expressed to me that I should get in touch with Donald, which I did, and uh, he sent me an application at Howard University. I started Howard like the last week in August and we have the freshman orientation at Howard University. And so this is the very first time Donald's actually hearing me play. So I asked him, is it okay if I sit in? He said, sure. We play for the uh, freshman orientation. And from that point, he says, uh, I want you to start playing in the band. So just about from the time I got there, I started working with Donald. Donald had an album called Blackbird. And uh, it was like uh, what I considered the the beginning of what they call jazz fusion. I don't I had been with him for a few months, maybe five or six months. And I remember getting on the elevator in the fine arts building at Howard. And Donald was saying, this is this new stuff that's coming out. Donald was able to get a deal on fantasy prestige records with the students that were in his band. And he called us the Blackbirds. And uh, we got a chance to uh, record separately even though we traveled as one band we had two separate record deals so, and that's that's how the blackbirds came to be well you know alan and i were always friends when we were at in howard university 
and I had a little black Volkswagen, and, and so I picked him up every every day to go to class. But we had to stop by the Shabazz to get a bean pie and some fish and some fish sandwich from the Muslim place, and go to school. And you know, so we went to class together. We hung out together, man. Uh, he just had a lot of fun doing you know musical things and just do things. You know what I mean? And so uh, you know uh, once he you know, was left the birds for a while. Then I got him back. I got a chance to take him to Europe with us, you know, and go to England and Birmingham and all those kind of places. It was always good. But um, I've always been blessed for people to give me instruments because I'm always giving instruments to my kids, children, students. And some guy from the National Symphony Orchestra gave me his clarinet. And this clarinet costs about $30,000, okay? So I gave it to Alan. And he didn't play it. He opened it and he smelled it. <laughs> yeah. So we, man, we cried together, we laughed together. We had such a good time, man. And, and uh, uh, you know, we had eating up the food and we cooking and going out and doing stuff like that. But like on Sundays, because I have a gospel choir male course, I'd bring him to church with me, man. He'd play and I'd play piano with my choir. So it was a really wonderful thing. And we did an off-Broadway musical called uh, Fried Chicken and Latkes. And that's me and Alan. I'm playing piano, he's playing high school. After you play your last note, Alan, what is it that you want people to remember about you? That uh, every time he played, or every time I played, that um, that I gave it as much as I could, and I hope that uh, every performance is better than the last. You know. What do you think the most important thing that you're going to leave is? That's hard to say at this point, but what I would like to do is hope that my music contributes to world peace flat out.